Hello, um, today I'm going to be talking about a group of ceramics recovered in February 2021 by the Cambridge Archaeological Unit at the site of Clare College in Cambridge. So Clare College was founded in the 14th century and is still a continuing institution today, situated on sort of the west side of the historic core of Cambridge next to the River Cam. So the assemblage I'm going to talk about derives from a culvert, which was backfilled at some point between 1879, which is the date of the latest artifact that we found in it, and 1885, because on that date we have an ordnance survey plan of the site that shows that a redevelopment has taken place and the culverts are no longer there. Um, this was an interesting excavation, three metres deep next to the River Cam, so lots of good ground conditions and it ended up being a bit of a smash and a grab exercise to get things out. Um, this is a map which shows a map of 1856 of the whole college and you can see the area with the culverts next to the river. We've got a detail of it and you can see the culverts as excavated and then you can see a later plan which shows that the culverts have been replaced by later subjects. This is located within an area known as the North Passage which is basically the ancillary service wing of the college and the culverts were basically for pumping raw waste into the river cam. So essentially we recovered a large number of items, over 200, and when you calculate it by most means, including minimum number of items, the dining related ceramics that I'm going to focus on today is the single largest group. And there's lots of other interesting material, but constraints of time means I'm just going to talk about this the dining related ceramics. Um, we have good, very good dating evidence for the ceramics that we recovered, partly because Clare College actually used to be called Clare Hall. It changed its name in 1856, but also because the college cooks and scullions supplied the ceramics, their names occur on them. And that means that through the college records, we can work out when these people were in post, and that allows us to date the ones that have those their names on them quite precisely. I mean, to a couple of years in some cases, to slightly longer periods in others. Um, so the dining room extracts I'm going to talk about, there are basically seven services, six of which have marked on them that indicate that they were commissioned specifically for the college. The college ordered them directly from manufacturers in Staffordshire. Seventh doesn't have that. And then there are various miscellaneous other ceramics as well. And you can see there are different proportions of these different patterns. So we know that the specifically commissioned collegiate services must be produced either by the fellows or the students. Um, the Students are self-explanatory. The fellows are basically the members of the college, the academic staff. And at this time, Cambridge was very much a collegiate university. You, your primary affiliation was to a college. And there are various rules that we've managed to work out over anal analyzing this kind of material for a while. So basically, ceramics were introduced for fellows before students. We can tell what some ceramics were for, were for because they actually mentioned their net who it's for. Pensioners is basically a 19th century term for students. Also, we know that the name of the cook does not appear on the front of ceramics used for fellows. And we have various documents. So in 1874, there's one that shows that there were two sets of services in use for the, for the fellows, their best plate and their second plate. It's also clear that ceramics for fellows were generally more expensive. And we can work out by the dating, largely by the cook's names, that certain services actually replace other services. Um, I'm just going to whiz quickly through the services. This is the first one introduced, which basically has a very nice blue transfer print view of the college. This is a very classic Cambridge College ceramics view kind of thing to use and very obvious one. But actually, Claire is the first place to introduce it. Moving on, we have this polychrome pattern, quite expensive, that's introduced known as the Bentic pattern. We have Village Church, which was introduced slightly later. Another blue transfer printed design. Then we have some willow pattern, which again, it comes in slightly later and occurs in, is obviously a very standard pattern of the period. And, but we can tell here because it's specifically marked that it was specifically for use in the college. Then we have the multi-scroll pattern. 
the ribbon and star pattern, again, a which includes hand painted elements. A black floral and geometric pattern. Now, this, this one is not specifically collegiate. We found quite a lot of vessels, so it was clearly in use as a service at the college, but it's not specifically marked as being produced for the college. We also, which suggests it was actually probably not used in the main hall, but somewhere else, perhaps at the master's lodge where the master and his family lived, or in the butler's accommodation where the butler and their family lived. Plus, we have miscellaneous individual plates that crop up, which we think are probably just personal use for fellows or students when they're in their sets of rooms at the college. Um, so here we have our seven patterns and these the different uses of ceramics relate to hierarchy and intergroup identity within the college. And one of the most clear things is that cost is an important factor. So Ceramics, which are quite expensive compared to the wooden vessels that are being in use up to that time, were introduced first for the fellows. Fellows then get very nice polychrome, expensive vessels, whereas students are always having the cheaper transfer printed designs. And in fact, at some point, they they changed to using the willow pattern, which is actually the cheapest transfer printed design that you can buy at that point in the mid 19th century. So that's telling the students something about their relative status. You can also, I hope, see something between these. The, the services are arranged in sort of chronological order of their introduction. And you can see that from the top row to the bottom row, there is some kind of probable changing aesthetic going on. Later services are much plainer, whereas the other, whereas the earlier ones are quite heavily decorated. Um, that is probably in fitting with general aesthetic trends of the time. Um, so all Cambridge colleges have their dining services by the mid 19th century. And the interesting thing is how different they are. I like to think of this as the narcissism of small differences. Basically, Cambridge colleges are obsessed about how different they are from each other. To outsiders, they always look as a very homogenous group, but they, they fixate upon their differences. And this seems to be particularly true about neighbouring colleges who are of relative similar size. So one of the other colleges next door to the north of Clare is Trinity Hall. And we know a lot about its ceramics from a couple of discoveries uh, which have been published. And essentially, Trinity Hall seems to adopt dining ceramics later than Clare Hall, Clare Hall and basically doesn't adopt any of the things that Clare Hall has done. So instead of having a view of the college, it goes for a sort of her semi heraldic college badge based on its crest instead. So Trinity Hall seems to be very clearly choosing not to emulate Clare Hall in its ceramics because it wants to stress its differences. Um, there are probably quite a few things we can argue about the ceramic choices that Clare Hall made. We don't have records of any of these, but perhaps one of the most obvious is that the view of Clare College or Clare Hall that we know at the time that they adopted is one that emphasises the view of Clare Hall itself. It's front and centre on the design. King's College Chapel is lurking in the background. That seems very obvious, but in fact, most 19th century ceramics that call themselves of Clare Hall, such as the ones produced by Ridgeway as part of their series, actually it's King's College Chapel that dominates, as you can see from the slides. So clearly Clare Hall, when they came along to design ceramics, went, no, 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 we are not putting King's College Chapel in the front of our design. We're, we're got picking one that looks like us. Um, there may be other choices going on. So the village church pattern, which we know was used by students, the choice of that is quite likely to be linked to the subsequent, subsequent religious careers of the students at the college. At the time when this pattern is introduced and in use, 60% of the graduates of Clare Hall go on to have religious careers. This, this is not unusual in Cambridge at the time. I mean, various historians have described it as effectively a regional ecle theological college rather than a proper university at this period, which is a slight exaggeration. And most of them actually go on to become Anglican churchmen. So in some ways, it's possible that the choice of this service is basically referencing where the students are going to end up after college in some manner. We also have at some point on the service that shows Clare Hall, we have these vessels, which we know from Clare Hall documents, they refer to as vegetable dishes. 
and they have on their sides and lids these little lion head handles for holding them and for lifting the lid. Um, this is not unparalleled in 19th century ceramics, but it's a relatively unusual ceramic choice. It's not a common thing. And I did wonder when we found these, which because they attract a lot of attention. They're, they're, they're very nice looking when you find them in the ground. What was going on? And then one day going to work at the front gates of the college, I spotted these urns on the top of the gates, which have lion's head decoration on them. So I do wonder whether we're looking at the ceramics in some sense, referencing the college gates in some manner. Um, one of the interesting things to look at is the different relationships of various individuals or groups within the colleges to the ceramics. I'm not going to go into this in great detail because there isn't time to go through the whole gamut of them. But I mean, one of the most common names in our assemblage is that of John Bradford, who was the cook between 1874 and 1889. And the obvious thing is that although Bradford has to order and buy these cooks, for which he gets paid a stipend of £1,200 a year, in addition to his other fees, is his contact is mainly financial and business working. He isn't actually ever going to use these to eat from. So that's one kind of relationship. Another interesting relationship is with the person who was the master or head of the college at the time, Edward Atkinson. He, he had a very, very long career at Cambridge. He's one of the longest people ever associated with the Cambridge College. So he started as a student, became a fellow, and then was a master spanning 1838 to 1915, and basically spanning the entire period of, of good college ceramic assemblages. When he started off as a student, students didn't, at Clare didn't actually have any ceramics to use. They were still using wooden vessels. Then he becomes a fellow, at which stage he'll use the pattern with the uh, view of Clare Hall. Then while he's a fellow, that gets upgraded, and then they have the polychrome benthic pattern. And then later on, after he becomes master, he still continues to dine in hall, we know from records quite frequently, probably over 50% of the time for most evening meals of the year. He would, so he would see the changing ceramic patterns there. And he would also have used the pattern that was in use at the master's lodge, which we can't be certain if it's this black geometric floral pattern or not, but he would have been using sort of two services in parallel, depending on where he dined each evening. And he would have had a very long term and view of this and he would have known the history. He would also have been involved with the decision to basically get rid of ornate college ceramics in the early 1890s and replace them with very much plainer ceramics. So you could compare this say to one of the students at the time when the material was deposited and basically they would have a very short term view. They would they would dine in, in hall for eight weeks a term, 24 weeks a year for three years, and they basically only know about the one ceramic set that students use. So there are very different levels of knowledge going on. Um, one of the important points to come out of this work, which is slightly dispiriting as someone who studies this material, is that the ceramics don't correlate that well with the actual population that generates them. And um, that's because they're not throwing away everything. They're throwing away a specific selection of material they are discarding, they're, they're taking an opportunity to clear out, but they're not clearing out everything. So this culvert is good, but they're not throwing away all the ceramics from the kitchen because Claire Hall is carrying on the next year and they want, still want the good stuff. So they discard, seem to discard any vessels from services that are no longer in use. So we have quite a lot of those. And then damaged or heavily worn vessels from services that are still in use or Possibly they were actually even preferentially discarding those ones that had old cook's names on them, people who predated Bradford as the cook. So this means that they weren't actually throwing away a very representative assemblage of ceramics necessarily. And one thing that's very clear is that the ratio of fellows to pensioners at the college, of students rather, is very different to the ratio of ceramics. The other thing is that the ratio of vessel forms, which we know from the 1874 list and the 1889 assemblage, there are some relatively good correlations in terms of the number of dinner plates, say, but other things don't work nearly so well. For example, we didn't find any soup plates in the assemblage. And generally, we actually don't find very many soup plates at all, given the numbers there must have been, which I've never quite understood why we can't find soup plates, but that is one of the issues of the thing. 
Um, so thank you. This has been the sort of whistle sort store of the dining rate ceramics. I hope I've shown that there's a lot of interpretive potential and these are the acknowledgements to the various people who have contributed to the work because as always in archaeology, this is very much a group effort that I have been presenting. Thank you.